Our first speaker is Damon B. Akins, a professor of history at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, where he teaches Native American, American West, and environmental history. In what feels like another life, he was a high school social studies teacher in Los Angeles. Our second speaker is William J. Bauer, an enrolled citizen of the Round Valley Indian Tribes and a professor of American Indian history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His research is focused on oral history, labor, and California Indian history. Bauer is the author of California Through Native Eyes, Reclaiming History, as well as We Were All Like Migrant Workers Here, Work, Community, and Memory on California's Round Valley Reservation, 1850 to 1941. More recently, he and Damon co-authored We Are the Land, A Native History of California, and they are here to talk about this award-winning book with us. Please give a warm virtual welcome to both our speakers. Thank you. Um for a warm virtual welcome. I see some applause in the chat. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I, we usually start as uh, Sue did with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming to you tonight from Mexico City and I'm not gonna touch that one because that feels like an entirely different can of worms, but it's an incredibly indigenous space and one that honors it in ways that the United States can't imagine. Normally I live in Greensboro, which is, uh, Saponi, Sara, Cherwa land, um, and but tonight I'm coming uh, from a little further away. Uh, welcome everyone. Again, my name is uh, uh, William Bauer, um, and I'm speaking to you to all today from uh, Southern Paiute lands here in, in Southern Nevada. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Dev, uh, Sue, and, and Elena for kind of inviting us to this to, to this today and, and for setting up our, our talk. We really appreciate uh, this opportunity to talk to everyone and take advantage of kind of the, the ability to kind of do these kind of the, these kind of talks uh, virtually. I mean, I think what we were planning on doing is talking for about you know maybe forty or fifty minutes and then open up uh, have a kind of ample time for for discussion for Q and A. I mean, I think that we've both we've done some of these before and we've really kind of appreciated being able to discuss the book. Uh, with with kind of a lot with the audience, uh, so we'll kind of hopefully we'll we'll leave a lot of time for, for Q and A at, at the end. Um, I thought I might begin by telling you all a little bit about the book, uh, what it attempts to cover, and what it what it aims to do. Um, we are the land. It's a it's a it's a survey of of California Indian history. It it begins with California Indian creation stories, and it goes all the way up to the year uh, 2020. Uh, Damon and I. Uh, sent the, the 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 final or one of the drafts <laughs> to the University of California Press right in the middle, like in the spring of 2020, when the world kind of was closing down because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but that also kind of gave us an opportunity to include um, at kind of the references to COVID-19 in, Cal in California and how California Indian na nations kind of addressed uh, the global uh, the global pandemic. Uh, one of the things, one of the ideas that we wanted to do in the book is re to refute the notion that California Indians kind of disappeared from the state. Uh, rather, that indigenous peoples are central to understanding California history. Um, it, I think part of this stemmed from a conversation I had with a, uh, with a California Indian um, author. Um, and, he, and he was kind of talking about, I mean, he, he was kind of remarking that there was still this perception that California Indians had vanished in, in, uh, from, from California. And this was in like, you know, 2018, 2019 or something along those lines. And so I think for both of us, I mean, I think that was kind of the guiding force of, of or guiding kind of idea about the book is to kind of articulate, clearly articulate this idea that California Indians never disappeared from the state. They've always been there. They've been kind of central to the, the history of, of the state. And I might even say, you know, I, I think that's maybe something we can kind of discuss maybe later, but uh, one, but central to kind of understanding United States history, understanding North American history. And I, because I think sometimes California Indians, because we're on the West Coast and the Pacific Coast uh, seem kind of far from kind of shaping the rest of the nation. But I, I think that if we kind of think through some of these things a little bit more, uh, a little bit more kind of critically, we begin, be, we begin to kind of shape and kind of see how California Indians shaped shaped United States history. Uh, and so I think if the book right has an has kind of a central argument or you know a kind of a theme is that uh, California Indians have been central to California history uh, because they've maintained a relationship with the with the land uh, at the same time that settler colonial policies by Spain, Mexico, uh, California, and the United States have attempted to divorce uh, indigenous peoples for the land from the land. And that's what we try to kind of capture with with the title, We Are the Land. 
uh, I, the book was originally going to be titled kind of we use the land or we use the land was kind of a, a, a kind of a what a, a placeholder right for 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 the for the title and and David and I we, we were both I mean we we kind of tossed it out there but we were both kind of not quite always comfortable with that title and then as we kind of jockey back and forth and toss ideas back and forth uh, I think when when we finally settled on we are the land as being the title I think everything kind of clicked for us and it allowed us to kind of bring kind of this big, long, big, diverse history of indigenous peoples within the state um, kind of kind of together. And, and I think really began, allowed us to kind of articulate that idea that you cannot understand California history without understanding California Indian history. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few things along the same lines. Yeah, um, you know, I write the word California a lot uh, uh, in my, and I, I'm surprised how many times I misspell it, uh, Cafalonia um, and all those other things. And, and with the book, uh, We Ate the Land shows up a lot. And I've just sort of thought about that as the settler counterpoint to this. But, uh, but no, I wanted to echo some of the things that Willie had said. We, we, we had a very clear vision for the audience, not a specific vision, not a specific audience, but we really knew that we wanted this book to be uh, public facing. We wanted people who may not be drawn to read uh, the kinds of books that we normally write, um, but would be drawn to to, to read this one. Um, personally, I have always imagined and hoped to find the book in the gift shop at a California mission. I've not found that yet, and if anybody ever does, please let me know, because I think that would be a really great example of the kind of people who would not necessarily be looking for a book like this, but would be drawn to it because of the situation. Um, th that, that goal informed so much of what we did from the, the tone we used, the way we wrote, the, the way we structured the book, um, to the images that we used, uh, the cover image in particular. Um, it's a, a really beautiful image. Uh, we're very great, grateful that Kara Romero, who's a Chema Webby photographer, allowed us to use it um, because it, it captures that, that sensibility we wanted. It's youthful, it's modern, it's present. Uh, it, it is not um, the past and it's not uh, drenched in red and uh, it's not a, a narrative of erasure. This is something that looks very much like a future. Uh, so that that was part of it. Um, the way, as I said, the way we structured the book, um, you know, we're historians. So we approach questions about with an eye on change over time. And we tend to organize things chronologically. Uh, that's how the profession sort of defaults. And so initially we had the book um, scheduled out as a series of chronologically based chapters. And initially we were struggling with a little bit about how to adapt those because those of you who can really geek out about this sort of stuff, periodization is a, is a charged thing. You know, the age of Jackson, like who gets to say that that's what we call the age. Um, and uh, so we, we were thinking, how are we going to create the, the, period, the periods, periodic categories that we wanted? And what are we going to you know, diminish and what are we going to build on? And I think out of those conversations and also the desire to have a real public audience, um, we came up with the idea of these vignettes between each of the chapters. There's nine of them, and uh, we call them native spaces. And we highlight nine places, eight of which are in California proper, one of which we argue is uh, a satellite office, so to speak, of California, that's Rome. Um, and we, we sort of cha we changed the way we were writing a bit. Instead of it being a story driven by narrative change over time, cause and effect, it was more of just a colleague of mine calls it turning the jets off and uh, or turn the, in the motor off and let the boat float for a second in specific places. And uh, we I really enjoyed writing those. I think Willie did too. It was, a, it was a nice break. And we've been really happy with the way they've been received because our goal was that people would be able to read the book. Um, and obviously we couldn't hit all the spaces, but the people would be able to read the book and a healthy number of them would be able to look out the window and see uh, the things that we're talking about and kind of carry the, the story into the, into the built environment and their everyday lives. And so I think those, some of those are some of the issues that we really wanted to, to stress persistence, survivance. We wanted to make sure that um, 
We paid very close attention to tents as we do normally, but particularly so here. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that the images and the stories and everything really pushed forward. At the same time, um, you know, there's a tension in there, the survivance, uh, but also you have to capture the the horrors that have been that have happened, and we we struggle with how to do that. We we wanted to make sure that we got the story of the violence that had been perpetrated against Native people into the book, but not allow that to become the story. Uh, and, and I think we did. I'm proud of the way that part of it came out. I think, Damon, of, of, of many people, I think you'll be pleased with uh, with someone with something someone said to me a couple of weeks ago when they were when we were talking about the book. Uh, I was doing a presentation at UC Davis ab about the text, and then they said they saw the book in a modern art museum. Um, I think right that that speaks to obviously like the having Carol Romero's photo photograph on the cover of the book, but I think it kind of speaks to something right that our our kind of desire for this book to be public facing, but also to reach audiences that that we as historians don't often kind of try to to grab, right? I mean, I I don't I don't think I of my other two books would ever be in a modern art museum or anything on those lines. But there's something I think about this text that I think does, I, I think, I, you know, I think one of the successful things that we've done with the book is that it's been able to kind of reach this kind of broad audience and uh, and, and hit kind of different kinds of, 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 of people and groups in California that I think that we are trying to kind of, kind of reach with, with the text. Um, one of the other things that I was kind of really pleased or what, that I think we both kind of emphasized uh, when, in writing this book or thinking about this book is that we were able to build on the work of, um, of two other indigenous scholars in, in California. So we're, this is not the first kind of survey of, of California Indian history that that's, that's out there. There has been kind of two others that were written, written beforehand. Um, uh, the first was written by the Lenape scholar, uh, Jack Forbes, who wrote a book called Native Americans of California and Nevada. Uh, he published this book in the 1960s and then it was revised in, in 1982. Um, Jack Forbes was, a, was an early leading figure in the development of, of Western history, uh, the, the methodology of ethno history. Um, he what kind of went, one of his first books that he wrote was a, was a history of the Quechua nation, nation in, in, uh, along, the, along the Colorado River. Um, he becomes, I mean, he is very kind of active in kind of the, in political activism in the 1960s and the 1970s in California, especially kind of involved in some of the education groups that operated in, in Northern and Central California. He helped found DQ University uh, for Indigenous people, uh, kind of in a hemispheric kind of perspective. Uh, and then he was one of the founders of the Native American Studies program at UC Davis. And, and as many of you know, right, uh, UC Davis is one of the few universities in the United States in which you can get a PhD in, in Native American studies. Um, and then the other person that who, who wrote a kind of a survey of California Indian history was, was Rupert and Jeanette Costo. Um, and who wrote a book called Natives of the Golden State. Uh, Rupert was Cahuilla from Southern California. Much like Jack, he was also a political activist in the realm of education in the 1960s. He wrote early on about kind of how textbooks depicted California, uh, about depicted American Indians in general. Um, he was one of, he was, he's kind of an initial person, right, Damon, who, who kind of launched the attack on the, on the, on the Spanish mission, uh, you know, sugar cube mission assignment. I mean, he was saying that back in the 1960s. Right, so there, so he, uh, um, uh, so he and his wife also kind of wrote, um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of wrote a, these kind of synthetic works on on Californian history. But as we both kind of sat back and looked at both of those kind of books, I mean, Damon, you probably read the both of those for your your, uh, you know, our, our mutual advisor Al Hurtado, right? Probably made you read both of those he, books too. He gave me he gave me his copy of Costo. So he gave <laughs> he, you have that. I have I am, it. Yeah. Now I am jealous. Maybe I'll make a trip to South, South, uh, North, uh, yeah, North Carolina when you're in Mexico right now. <laughs> um, I think the problem, though, that we saw is both of those books were a, were a bit dated, and I don't mean that kind of in a critical way. But you know, Jack wrote his in the 1960s, and again, like revised it in the 1980s. Uh, the Costos published theirs in the early, uh, like the late 1980s, early 19, 1990s, and so I think we both saw an opportunity and a need, right, to, to revise. Uh, people's understandings of indigenous people in California. And I think critically, they didn't really cover the 20th century. And for us, um, it was essential that this book address the 20th and, and now, right, I think even the 21st century for indigenous people in, in, in California, because if we were kind of gonna, gonna make this argument about persistence, about survivance, 
to end the story in the in the 19th century as kind of Rupert and 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 Jack tended to do you know uh, Jack uh, Rupert much more than than Jack did. Um, we needed to kind of bring that book into the 20th century and, and emphasize the 20th and, and 21st century. And so if you look at the, if you kind of look at the table of contents in the book, you can think about like almost half of the book is, is centered in that 20th and, and 21st century period, time period, which is, I think was essential for us to both to address and cover. Yeah, I, I would say um, what that meant when we were in, in actual writing and some of the, the feedback we've gotten you know, we, we condensed, we compressed uh, our treatment of some of the issues uh, that often get attention. Um, it, it looks like a lot of you are in California. I hate to even ask the question, but many of you can probably remember your fourth grade mission project. The missions are covered. The missions um, are in the curriculum, not to be clear, the missions are in the curriculum in the 19th century and native people are depicted in a passive and victimized way if at all. Uh, and then they disappear in the 20th century. But so we had to, had to kind of balance, um, how do we tell stories that, that are gonna connect with the stories people know and therefore be familiar without emphasizing those stories? And so one example of that is, is the way we uh, dealt with the story of Ishi. And um, I'm assuming people in California, a number of people in California know the story of Ishi. Um, if you don't, it's a fascinating story. Willie's written really beautifully about it in Boom magazine. It's a great short article there. Um, but he's a, it's a it he's by far the the early 20th century's most well known native person. Um, but for reasons that we really wanted to resist, and it sort of reminds me of colleagues of mine and friends uh, who teach in religious departments, religious studies departments, and they find themselves having to teach uh, texts before they can then teach people to unlearn them. And it was sort of like this, you know, we, we, we couldn't ignore Ishii, but we also didn't want to give space and time to kind of replay the same narratives again and again, because they're not just tired, they're also not even just counterproductive, they're, they, they do violence to history. So what we did with that story is we turned it into one of the, uh, the, the spatial vignettes, and we worked to think about a place um, that was really critical to a lot of Native people and then think about how people move through that space, including Ishi. And we, I think, did a good job of offering enough information that you know you can go look it up. It's not hard to find. But we presented the story in a way that really emphasized uh, attachment to place, uh, survivance, persistence against uh, the, these incredible odds. One of the stories that I use when I teach this to my students is, you know, um, I'm 51. And that's roughly the age that Ishii was when he um, uh, came to San Francisco. And I'd be, and he lived approximately four more years, I'd be pretty pissed off if someone decided that what value, what mattered in my story was the last four years, not the first 50. And so I think we, we tried to capture that space a bit more. I also wanted to come back to something Willie said and I, that I really agree with. Um, and I want to emphasize it because I do think it'd be interesting to touch on in the Q&A. The idea that California natives are critical to California history. I think everybody can agree, but also that they're critical to, to Native American history writ large and American history. Um, I think those last two are almost synonymous. I don't think you can teach American history without teaching Native American history. It's We are the predominant settler nation in the world. And settler colonialism is a structure, not an event, as anybody who's ever taken an introductory class to settler colonialism learns. So we are a settler nation today. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, some examples there. When I was working on the book um, and talking about it with my parents, um, I mentioned the fact that, you know, we, that we are a settler nation and you started using that language. And um, my mom was very visibly uncomfortable with the idea of calling us settlers. And I had a really interesting conversation. And I said, you know, it's, it's take, it took me a little bit of time. 10 years ago, I didn't. Five years ago, I didn't really identify as a settler just because I think changes have happened pretty quickly. But as we talked through it, I mean, I didn't choose to settle. I didn't settle. I, and my ancestors did, but I benefit from that. And so in the same way that we, we think differently now about racial history, um, I think we are beginning to tackle the question of settler history. So the point I'm trying to make is just that um, if the United States is a settler nation, some of the clearest examples of that process happening are in California and uh, everything from the first reservations uh, 
some of the first reservations to the kind of ridiculous myth making of uh, the Spanish fantasy past, which is a, a really classic example of, of a way that settlers often uh, replace native people by holding up images of them, that is mascots, et cetera. So there's a lot of, there's a lot that California history and California native history has to offer American history if we're trying to understand uh, our settler past and present. Yeah, um, David, I'm glad you kind of took, picked up on that, that line. I, I was reading the chat um, a, a bit ago and um, Andrea said something, it's like, it, it's very strange to remember the pur purpose of taking like field trips to, to missions. And I responded and I'll, and I'll kind of expand it on this a little bit. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I kind of got into kind of writing history and, and kind of prompted me to kind of go into to PhD, to a, kind of get a PhD in history and, and that sort of thing. And then ultimately kind of write, write this book, right? I mean, I recall field, field trips in, in grade school where, they took us to like Sutter's Fort in Sacramento and Vallejo's Rancho outside of Sonoma. And like, why are you taking California Indian children to places of enslavement? Right? I mean, there's this kind of, the, and, 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 but it's not ever kind of taught, taught in that way. I mean, I remember, I, I think Cameron, I've, I've been to Sutter's Fort within the last, I think, five years. And I did like the little tour of Sutter's Fort and I, you know, had the wand up to my ear and listened to the narrative. And I swear, I think Native people were only mentioned once or twice in the entire kind of bit audio tour of, of, of Sutter's Fort. And I mean, th you know, that, those kind of like Damon, as you kind of were saying, right? It's, it's it, these kind of narratives that, especially that kind of kind of exist in California that seek to kind of eliminate or erase indigenous peoples from the state's history. And so, you know, we were, I think we, what we, we worked really hard to write, um, you know, kind of challenge some of the kind of the pre-existing narratives that exist about California Indian people. And I, we've kind of talked about these before, but I might go, go over them a little bit, right? Is that there's this, this idea that California Indians are especially kind of primitive people. And, you know, you were, uh, Damon kind of mentioned Ishii here, right? And, you know, he's called in like by newspapers, the last stone age person or the stone, last stone age Indian. And like this kind of idea that Ishii and other California Indian people are kind of especially primitive or more primitive than other kind of indigenous peoples in North America. Uh, and then the other idea, right? Uh, and that we've kind of mentioned a little earlier or throughout kind of our little talk here is um, our California Indians somehow disappear. Um, and that often this is kind of seen as kind of a natural process, uh, which of course ignores the campaigns of genocide committed by the United States, uh, the deliberate actions to kind of destroy California uh, or indigenous California environments. Uh, and then even the kind of the work of anthropologists who, who also were, co who colluded uh, in, in erasing and eliminating indigenous peoples from the state, right? I mean, kind of the famous statement by Alfred Kroeber, who says like in the, you know, the anthropologist Al Alfred Kroeber, and then who says in the 1920s, that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's essentially indigenous peoples in the San Francisco Bay area are extinct and, and they, they vanished, and, and, except that they were still living there, <laughs> still working and, and doing, you know, and, and then, yeah, and still, yeah, who, who were still there. And, and so, you know, if you kind of pick up on the text and we kind of make sure that we kind of highlight spaces where indigenous peoples ha have been eliminated or have been seen thought to be eliminated. So we, we do spend a lot of time, say, kind of it's discussing kind of the indigenous history of the Bay Area um, and, and the other these other kind of areas where indigenous peoples have been kind of uh, kind of, yeah, kind of, have been kind of eliminated. I mean, I think both of us were kind of have been in a lot of ways kind of influenced by our, our academic advisor, uh, I think in a couple of ways, right? So our advisor, Al Hurtado, kind of wrote a book called uh, Indian Survival in the California Frontier, kind of really kind of challenge, you know, back in the 1980s, kind of again, kind of challenging the, this idea that California Indians vanished. But I mean, it, it for some reason, it it still hadn't kind of kicked into kind of some of the, the other narratives that, that, that we've seen or other kind of uh, perspectives. And I think too that we were kind of uh, have we've been able to, we've been influenced by a, a good cadre of other scholar the the kind of the robust scholarship being produced by Calif young California Indian scholars especially in the last ten or fifteen years. And I, I'm thinking here of like Kutcher Risling Baldy, uh, uh, Brittany Ar Ar Arona, uh, Olivia Chilcott, who have done kind of really kind of great job, uh, kind of uh, kind of kind of pushing forward this idea of kind of indigenous survivance and. And persistence. I remember kind of attending kind of a, um, a, a talk with some of them, and, and they were and one of the. What, I can't. Someone mentioned it's. It's not about survival. It's about how California Indian nations have thrived and have continued to, to thrive. And I know that kind of pushes. I mean, and you obviously you you must kind of address it in in the book that we did, and we kind of spent a lot of time talking about this, right? We got to talk about the devastating aspect of the mission period. We have to talk about uh, California Indian genocide. We have to talk about uh, kind of termination and land loss in the 19th and the 20th century. 
but California Indian nations continued to thrive, right? <laughs> they're, they're, you know, it's in, in the 19th century, the 20th uh, and, and the 21st. And so, um, you know, we, re we really wanted, again, kind of build on that idea and kind of carry that forward that, that these kind of previous surveys of California Indian history kind of stopped in 1900. And we needed to kind of bring these stories as much into the present as we possibly could. Uh, one book that I'd add to that, a different generation, but uh, uh, Debbie Miranda's book, uh, Bad Indians, not a historian, she's a poet, but I remember when that book came out, we had uh, just started uh, work on our book, and uh, I think we were a year or two in, and that book came out, and I thought, um, wow, I mean, that, that, that she is just a totally different book, but she has just done such a great job of, of what we're trying to do. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and yeah, I see that, Nathan. If we, if we can't do it while we're talking, I'm sure we can share some of that work uh, later. Um, the other thing I was going to say about jargon, again, you know, we wanted this book to be read by people who don't read jargon. We wanted, we, we worked hard with our press to figure out a way to provide sources um, without the, uh, you know, what they told us, I know Willie and I find it hard to believe that not everybody loves footnotes and endnotes, um, but, you know, apparently uh, the, quote, general reader finds them a bit off-putting. So we, we worked with the press to come up with a way to provide um, sources, source materials. So any quote we use in the book, we have a reference to it at the end in a, a short little essay on where we found the sources. As a teacher, I teach the, our methods course and our, our capstone course and uh, you know I was thinking a lot about like how do you tell students or how do you tell people who are interested to go back and, and dig deeper into the how do you follow the sources back but that was one of the sort of concessions or compromises we made we wanted to make sure it didn't look um, too academic uh, another is the jargon you know we I've used the word survivance Willie's I think you may have used it too if not you've said uh, the same idea. It's not just about survival, it's about thriving. And survivance is a term that I think appears twice in the book. And, and to my mind, it's probably the only piece of jargon that we put in there. Um, you know, settlers appears a lot, but, but none of the jargon that I use when I teach my settler colonialism and indigenous sovereignty courses there. Uh, and I'm, I love that kind of heavy theory, heavy analytical language. But for this project, it really, we wanted it to make sure that we were um, not just throwing jargon around. And so survivance is a term coined by uh, Gerald Visner, uh, Anishinaabe uh, poet and literary critic. And I'm pleased to see that it's gotten, it just inc increasingly is getting mainstream, um, you know, attention. People, are, people are, you hear the word more and more, and it feels like one of those words at some point we'll, we'll be able to stop feeling like we need to say, a term that means, you know, just a term that means the thing. And uh, so that was one of the only pieces of jargon. I think those are some of the decisions that we were thinking about when we were, uh, when we were writing the book. Um, I had a, I've been writing down notes of things I wanted to come back to. Um, but I also did want to say, for those of you who are considering writing a book with someone else, uh, <laughs> we could, we could almost offer a, a seminar now because uh, we worked uh, through a lot of challenges, um, and some of that was just how to divide up the material, how to approach the material, how to write from what we know and what our experiences are, um, how to find a voice. We, we work differently, we write differently, we have different backgrounds and experiences, and I think I'm very proud of the fact that only a few people can figure out who wrote which passage. Um, you know, my partner, when she read it, she could say, that was you, right? I'm like, yeah, that was me, you know? And uh, because we did such a good job, I think, of just making sure that the text got, it went back and forth so many times. And, uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work with Willie on that and also for the, it, what I learned from it. So there's a bunch of other things that maybe we can come back to. I, I don't wanna blabber on. No, go ahead. I mean, if you want to, but um, I think there's one thing, uh, I think Debbie said in the chat, um, that um, about the kind of the Portola expedition and, you know, kind of these kind of early kind of encounters between indigenous peoples and, and Europeans in California. And that was, I remember we, we, we devoted, we didn't want to spend too much time on those kind of encounter pieces, but I, I think we really did want to kind of challenge and kind of reshape how people think about those kind of expeditions. And I think one of the things that we wanted to do was not look over the, uh, the shoulder of, of 
European explorers, but we wanted to kind of look over the shoulder of kind of indigenous peoples. And so we kind of used this, um, this metaphor of, of the beach, right, to kind of begin to kind of launch into and, and rethink kind of these, kind, these kinds of encounters and, and put, position ourselves right on the beach, whether that beach is outside of modern day San Diego or outside of modern day um, uh, up in Northern California, or even up the, the beach on the color, what is now the Colorado River, right? What was it like for indigenous peoples to, to see like these newcomers coming into their lands? And I, I think this moment is, is often kind of treated as one, uh, as one of rupture, but I think sometimes if you kind of look at it, I mean, I think it kind of indigenous peoples kind of encountered Europeans, at least initially, as they would have encountered other indigenous people coming into their territory. Uh, those people are either coming to, more than likely they're coming to trade. So, right, indigenous peoples kind of went out and 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 interacted with kind of Europeans and, and much much as they would have with 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 other indigenous peoples. And so, I kind of reframing and rethinking about those kinds of relationships from an indigenous perspective was uh, was something I think that guided us kind of throughout the text. And and I and I think it also kind of got us to think through about kind of aspects of um, uh, you know I think one of the challenges of the book is, is one kind of getting at this from an indigenous perspective, but two is kind of thinking about kind of the, the amazing diversity in California, right? If, if you look kind of a map of, of California, California is one of the most diverse spaces for, for indigenous peoples, right? More than 100 uh, different kind of indigenous languages are spoken in California. Uh, you know, Northern, and, and then as we kind of progress, Northern and Southern California kind of possess kind of different historical trajectories and different historical patterns. Uh, and then even then we, we sometimes, wanted to kind of erase the kind of the modern boundary of, of, of California. I think when people kind of think about California, right, Damon, they have this kind of idea as if it kind of still conforms to the, the current boundaries of the state. But, uh, but those are kind of rather relatively kind of recent in, in, in the history of indigenous people, uh, of indigenous people. And we wanted to kind of at least, uh, at least attempt to kind of get, not assume that that is a permanent boundary for, for, in, for indigenous peoples. And so, um, um, as we kind of progress, we kind of had to wrestle with this challenge of, or thinking about kind of, and making sure we balance that the fact that say Northern California indigenous histories were, were different than Southern California indigenous histories, especially say in the 20th century where, it, you know, in general, right? Northern California tribes were like supported the Indian uh, Reorganization Act that was passed in the 1930s where Southern California tribes uh, kind of held, kept it at arm's length. Whereas, and then in the 1950s, Southern California Indian tribes tended to be a little bit more supportive of termination policy, Northern California Indian tribes opposed. They had their own real kind of legitimate reasons for these kind of different perspectives and viewpoints. And so we took a lot of kind of, we, we took a lot of care to kind of, kind of discuss kind of the delicate kind of, uh, kind of political and social maneuverings of, of, of California Indian nations in the, uh, in the 20th century. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen uh, and just to show a couple images that tie back to what uh, Willie was saying. Um, you can see this, correct? It's two maps. Um, yes. I'm hoping, yes, thank you. So the map on the left, we had this grand idea when we started the project that we were going to have something like 12 maps. And then we started the process of you know, figuring out how we're going to do that and talking to the press. Because you know, one of the goals of keeping the book uh, public facing is cost. And uh, every additional image costs more, and so we 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 really had to think very carefully about what maps we used. We had these commissioned, um, and really, I'm forgetting the the cartographer's name. If you remember it off the top of your head, he does a lot of stuff. He's really great. Uh, Bill Nelson. Yes, thank you, Bill Nelson. Um, but we went back and forth with him and the press. Uh, basically, the issue was there's too much information here. Um, there are standards that cartographers and presses use about the minimus, the, the smallest font size that you can use to write captions about how you um, organize visual information so that it doesn't get crowded and remains legible. And what we were asking Bill to do was essentially break a lot of those rules. And you can see that more on the map on the right, the two maps, the one on the left is sort of, uh, you know, a, a prehistorical map, a map of of sort of the beginning of this story. And then the map on the right is one at the end. And we had to get a dispensation from the press to go down to, I think it was five point font. Um, and we were discussing this and saying, that's the point. I mean, that is the reason for this. The reason that we need it to be crowded 
is because we can't let design standards say, oh, well, there are more people here, but we just can't fit them in. So we're going to, you know, uh, gloss it by saying, you know, some big aggregate group or by whatever. And you can see this is a, a we've, I've zoomed into the area just north of the San Francisco Bay area. And we, I'm very proud of these maps. I think we, we did a great job, Bill did a great job of making what we were trying to get the, across. That is the map on the left has no man-made lakes. It has no, uh, nothing that would, wouldn't have been there. Um, and the map on the right has man-made lakes, state boundaries, all those other things. But we also retained the dotted lines that talk about tribal presence. So this is just an example of sort of the thought we were going, we put into and tried to work through to make sure that we weren't unintentionally, to, so we didn't do all this work writing the book and then um, put some maps in there that, that, that take California as a given and pretend that it's always been there and pretend that that boundary line meant something before 1848. Uh, and, and so those are just, those are two examples. Um, I want to look at a couple of the other images, if that's okay with you, Willie, that I think sort of uh, highlight those themes that we've been talking about, about persistence and also native people. Phil Deloria, who's a, a scholar at, uh, I think he's at Yale now, I can't remember now, but a major scholar in American Indian history has a book called Indians in Unexpected Places. And it's a, it's a great book that, that really plays with this theme about native people showing up where they're not supposed to be. And uh, we really wanted to, to make sure that we were depicting Native people in, in, a, in a broader way. Uh, these are just a couple of the images that are from the book. Um, this one is a, a boarding school. That's one of the stories you have to tell when you're telling Native American history is the boarding school story, another one of those tragic examples of settler logic or ill logic. What I love about this picture is that um, these kids, they're all, you know, kids and, and they were, uh, they're identified on the back of the photo and they show up in the narrative in a lot of other places. That is to say, Tom Arviso in the left shows up testifying in a land dispute in the 1930s. This is 1900. Um, you know, we know so many stories about these people. There's probably a 10 of them in this picture that show up somewhere else, either in the research or actually in the book itself. And there's something about not just seeing this image as a snapshot, which it is, that then disappears, but knowing that like the small, this, this, the small boy on the right of the left picture got in a dispute over land with one of the two taller boys standing just to, to his uh, right, our left. Those sort of things make them real. I mean, these are people who had lives that are very complicated and and went on past this picture, if that makes sense. So that's, this is just some of the examples. Similar with this one, when you think of Native American activism in 1970, there are other pictures you probably imagine, uh, pictures of Alcatraz, um, perhaps. But we wanted to focus on the sort of like unexpected appearances, the way Native people were working in a variety of different ways. This is the California Indian Education Conference at Cal State Chico which was a pioneering group of people uh, demanding radical changes to the way uh, education was structured. Um, also, I love this because it's in color and it's in black and white in the book. Um, here's another example, a pairing. This is a very well-known image by Louis Torres uh, from 1815. He was traveling with a, a Russian, um, I believe he was traveling with a Russian, I can't read the story exactly. He traveled along from all across the Pacific Ocean and down into California and he, did a ton of drawings and etchings and uh, they became published lots of different books. They're very widely available. This one is one he drew from life. That is, he was there at the time um, as opposed to just doing them later. And this depicts the hand game. This is a, uh, one of a number of varieties of, uh, of gambling, gaming, this, this opportunity to um, games of chance and you bet on them. What we love about this image is we didn't notice this. I think it was a book talk where I happened to open my book and on one right facing page is this next image and on one left facing page is this image. So that when you hold the book open, you have an image from 1815 of native people playing the hand game and an image from early 20th century of native people playing the hand game. And you know, this is totally unintentional, although it fit with exactly what we were trying to do. You know, we didn't, uh, 
we didn't set out to find images that would would lay open in the book that way. I wish we had, <laughs> because it does teach this idea or really emphasize this idea of persistence. Um, and in terms of like unexpected places, this is uh, the cover of news from Native California, a really great journal. Uh, and this is a wonderful image of Mabel McKay, a very well-known uh, Native basket maker and healer shaman. And she um, uh, she's, in this case, protesting uh, dam construction because the construction will flood um, gathering territory, places where she goes to gather uh, the material to make baskets. Uh, and the image of her standing in front of, a, of an earth mover uh, is just a really great way of capturing this sort of unexpected nature of it. This was an image that we um, uh, had to add in the last minute because we couldn't get one of our images, um, uh, we couldn't get approval, which is, it was COVID. It was really, no one was working at the museum at the time. Uh, but we, it, I ended up loving this image because there's so much about it. This, these are students at the Sherman Institute who you know, both this image and the image I think that comes next give lie to the idea that the boarding schools were about educating. They were, but they were about educating for a very specific type of life. And one that most of your time at school was meant doing, was spent doing work. Um, this is one of, this is the image that we couldn't get approval for. It's from the Sherman Indian Museum. And, um, you know, like I say, it's, it's called payday. And this was school. So uh, th there's, there's, you know, unexpected places sometimes help us understand stories that we think we know, right? So images of children in school um, are probably better understood as images of children at work. And unless you want me to go back to any of those, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, I, um, I, <clears throat> Nicole, I appreciate uh, your, uh, comments uh, in the in the chat right about um, renaming UC uh, Hastings Law School. Um, I think one of the things, and I, and I actually remember like sending the book off. I remember I sent the book off. We we both sent the book off almost like the final draft. And I and then I joked with Damon on the phone like uh, something about a second edition. And I think Damon wanted to jump through the phone and punch me right because I mean, it, it, you know putting something like this finally to bed right and then publishing a book like this finally. Um, is it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And then we had just done that. And here I am talking to Damon about a second edition. And I really, I mean, he was like, he's, he, he was at that time halfway across the, he was on the other side of the, the country and he, he wanted to kill me. But, <laughs> but I, think, I, I think, Nicole, your statement there, I think speaks I, I, you know, to, I think, one of the strengths and, and the weaknesses of, of the book is that Right, here we are, you know, we, we had we had to be in the book in 2020, we had to make kind of editorial changes. I think there's been some questions about that in the chat that I think we'll address. Um, but the fact that like there's been so much going on since we put the book to bed in 2020, that we could write other a whole other chapter basically about everything that has happened since say the pandemic in February of say March of 2020 till now. And that could be its own, it could be in its own chapter, right? There is just so kind of this, this kind of, I think it kind of just almost kind of proved the argument for us of kind of the centrality of indigenous people to the history of California, uh, the centrality of kind of indigenous people of California to, to, to United States history. Kind of that, that being said, I mean, I, I think that if, if I was to kind of re-edit some things, I, I think I would kind of, I think we would change a little bit of that, the focus in, in chapter 10, the, the last chapter of the book. I, th I think, um, if you read that chapter, it's, I think it's a little bit too focused on kind of the role of California Indians and kind of the gaming industry. And that's a kind of a, it, that's one of those moments where, you know, that almost, got, again, kind of proves our argument, right? You can't understand the history of Indian gaming in the United States without understanding California, right? That, that story is kind of front and center to that narrative. Um, and, I, and I think when we kind of drafted the kind of the, the proposal for the book, I think that's what we were kind of thinking. Um, but I think if we would kind of, and then, and even just what happened in the last referendum, um, you know, in the election, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the California Indian pushed to, for, you know, for, for uh, sports betting, right? It, it, it's kind of an ongoing uh, story. It, it's an ongoing history that, that, that will continue to, to kind of go forward. But I think if we had kind of a moment to maybe kind of step back a bit, peel back, I think, um, I think we might kind of think about and kind of bring in other stories and other perspectives, right? The, the fight to take down dams on the Klamath River, 
uh, the, the fish kills that happened on the Klamath River in the last couple of years. Um, and then also the kind of the current debate uh, among kind of ecologists about kind of indigenous fire use in, in California. You know, I, I think that could be kind of a thread you know, the, the indigenous use of fire could probably have been kind of a stronger thread throughout the book that I think that that could have enhanced it. And I think even, you know, as I kind of step back and I think Damon kind of your, your next, you know, your next research project, I think will kind of address this kind of quite nicely actually, is, is kind of divorce oneself from the missions even more than we, than we did. I mean, I, I think, you know, we framed that chapter about missions, about kind of an, an encounter or kind of a, a relationship between indigenous towns and Spanish missions. So it's not centered in missions. So it was kind of a, how did indigenous towns engage with kind of the Spanish mission, the, the, the Spanish missions. But I, I think that, you know, the work of, um, you know, archae um, anthropologist uh, Sim Schneider, I think would have, you know, kind of pushes us to do that a bit more. And I, I think kind of even kind of stepping away from the missions a, a little further, I think would have kind of strength, uh, would have been, uh, you know, would have, would, would have, I don't know, it's just something that I would have, uh, your thought and then that's that that dreaded second edition damon yeah so I, I i maybe i wanted to kill him at the moment but he's totally right i agree with him i agreed with him then it's just the thought of, of not being done with it for a while but I, I mean i remember that period and i'm sure some of y'all do as well when um we'd be reading these stories or in some of your cases living these experiences of these horrendous uh wildfires and the, the stories would be, this is the biggest wildfire in 25 years. And then two weeks later, it'd be the biggest wildfire in 25 years. You know, I mean, it would just, it would, it would just kept happening again and again. And I think there was that, that time when, I, I remember this comedian, I'm sure some of you know the story, she would do that, she'd come back six months later and talk to herself. And uh, so Julie from six months ago is talking to Julie from today and she's saying, oh no, what, what you think is bad is not. You know, and at one point uh, she's saying, remember that that horrible, uh, um, you know, that horrible uh, uh, drought and fire that killed so many, uh, lot, so much livestock in Australia. And she was going, oh yeah, right. I remember that, that was not, that didn't last a week. So I think we have to get back to that moment. That moment was so strange, but to, to Willie's points, I think fire is a, is a critical component and what has changed in, as some people in the chat are saying, what has changed in the last few years in terms of, of mainstreaming indigenous fire management practices is phenomenal. And um, we probably could have seen that or should have seen that coming, but it looks very different from 2022 than it did from 2020. For 2019, um, the other thing I was going to say to you know to answer some of the questions that have come up in the chat, um, you know, the the question of how we ended. If somebody asked about where we simmered for a bit. We we really did wonder like what do we how do we end this? And we seized on the story, um, and so the, the the last chapter that is is called closings. And um, it's about the island uh, uh, right outside of Eureka that was, you know, within the last 20 years in bits and pieces returned to the, to the people. And what was strange about that story is that when we wrote that, that was the, one of the few examples we could find. And between the time that we sent the manuscript in and the time it came out, we started hearing about other stories and people started telling us, oh, have you heard about this one? Have you heard about the... The, the California State Highway, or the, the Caltrans, uh, one, you know, people would just tell us about this at every event. And it's really great to realize that that was a moment that we thought was hopeful and that that hope has been kind of borne out. And I think the other question I would, uh, would, would respond to, somebody asked indirectly about the, or directly about the Indian Child Welfare Act case before the Supreme Court, which Willie and I were talking about, texting briefly about today and saying, I'm sort of hoping, imagining we're going to get a question about that. Um, it's very frustrating being a Native American historian and watching the Supreme Court do Native law. Um, I've, I've done a lot of legal history in my work, and um, you know, it's a really good example of how Native American history is just different. You know, for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had an abysmal record in Native American law. Um, and people find that hard to believe because she's such a, a powerful figure in the rights of minorities, but not with Native people. She had an abysmal record. And so I think, you know, listening to what they talk about it, listening to what they say, this argument that was made the other day, 
about how native people were at war with each other. So how can we even define them as a people? And, you know, it, there, it's just, his, it's ahistorical, it's settler colonial. Um, but I do want to say just a couple things. One is that if, if the decision in the Indian child welfare, I mean, first of all, the, 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 the the law is there for a very good reason, a, a longstanding practice of settler colonial societies taking children away from native parents. That's, that, is a, that is part and parcel of the, the whole thing. But if this is chipped away, if the law, if the Supreme Court rules uh, against the, um, essentially if they say that native people are a race and not a nation, uh, and therefore all of these practices are racially based and therefore fall under other forms of, of legal protection and are unconstitutional. If that happens, it's going to fundamentally undo many of the gains that have happened over the last few years with the Kurt decision and others uh, where Indians have been working uh, hard to assert their sovereignty. And it's no surprise that the organizations that are doing this legal work pro bono are the ones that represent gas and oil companies that you know, this is this is not at all the court case is not at all about the rights of Indian children. Uh, it's not even really about adoption. It's about sovereignty, um, and it's just very hard to watch this uh, happen and not feel like is does no one else understand? This is insane. So I will stop there. Yeah, it, it reminds me, we had a talk, uh, we invited some scholars to, uh, to do a Zoom uh, event at UNLV, and uh, they were making much the same arguments that, that Damon was saying about the, the decision. And uh, it reminds me of a uh, Lumbee scholar, uh, David Wilkins, uh, right? He says, uh, American Indians aren't minorities, they're, we're members of nations. Uh, and that's, that's under attack right now. And it, it has, as Damon was saying, kind of, it will have significant kind of reverberations about um, reverberations. Uh, I think kind of responding to the, the the statement in the in the chat about kind of what did we simmer on? I think although we wanted to kind of tell a broad history of California, I think the two things that we really simmered on were the mission period and the the period of genocide in, in the mid nineteenth century, um, because those are the those are the kind of the two kind of delicate issues in in California indigenous history. Uh, I, I think also you're you were taking on kind of big kind of narratives and stories that California likes to tell about itself, right? Someone mentioned in the in the chat earlier today, Andreas mentioned in the chat earlier today, right? kids take field trips to missions. Uh, kids take field trips to Coloma and, and you know, the, the site of the discovery of gold. And uh, we, we really kind of had, right, had to kind of write a, had to kind of really kind of think critically about and carefully about how we told that story and told that story from uh, as well as we could from an indigenous perspective. So I think that those would be kind of the two things that I would have, that I kind of tended to, I think we both kind of simmered on and we had many, many kind of long phone conversations about how to kind of address those, those, those two time, time periods uh, or those two, yeah, those two events. Uh, there was also kind of a, a, a statement or a question in the chat about uh, the native vignettes uh, and how we chose them and maybe one of our favorites. And I know Damon, you kind of mentioned the one on Ishi Wilderness. That's one of my favorites in the book because I think it kind of speaks to kind of the, some of the things that we attempted to do in the book, right? Is kind of reframing how we understand Californian history. Uh, and then I'll be honest, I think one of the ones that I, that I enjoy doing the most uh, is the one on Ukiah. Uh, mostly just because, you know, uh, I grew up, you know, 90 minutes from Ukiah, you know, really 90 minutes from Ukiah. I remember kind of driving through that area. Uh, and then also kind of speaking, and it kind of spoke to, um, I, some of kind of the, the, the histories that I've written in the past too, kind of the role of kind of migrant agricultural labor in, in California Indian lives. Um, there's also, we found another kind of great photo from uh, CSU Chico, their, their photograph ar archives that also provided the photograph of the, the native education activists. But there's a great one of, of a kind of a, it's called a Pomo days dating to, from 1978 and like two women doing it, doing a dance. Um, I think the Ukiah one was my uh, was was one of my favorites that I that I liked reading in the book. Uh, Damon, do you want to kind of build on that? Yeah, I want to say one thing. I also love the I loved all of them, but also the Ukiah one. Uh, the reason I love the Ukiah one is that it it hits a, a really does a good job of hitting a point that is an important one to raise. It's use of the term remote or out of the way, those sort of things. Like the places we picked, San Francisco or the Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego. Those are obvious, right? And um, we couldn't, they couldn't all be obvious because, uh, you know, one real like cynical way of, 
of thinking about this is let's just do all the university towns because that's where people are going to most likely be reading the book. And, but, you know, it, we didn't want it to be that way. We wanted it to really be a, a variety. And so the Ukiah plays does a great job of talking, the piece does a great job of talking about when you say the word remote, it means remote to whom. And Ukiah was a place that was made remote by settler colonialism. Um, but it is not remote to the people who live there and called it home. And that was, that's a, a point that I think we, we have to make over and over again. Um, I had one other thought and I didn't write it down. And so therefore it's gone. Um, I can't remember, it was something that Willie had said that I was gonna, uh, um, oh yeah, I was just nodding it. He's talking about how much we struggled with uh, including or balancing the story of the gold rush and the missions. And as he mentioned, my current project is a California history between those two time periods that doesn't really deal with either of them, um, kind of a micro history of California. And uh, what has been interesting to me as I've begun to work on this project is I am going to go out on a limb and say, I think we can tell California history quite well without the missions and without the gold rush. And I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't teach that. I'm just saying those aren't the representative stories we used to think they are. I think they're interruptions into what we might call the real story of California, which uh, it looks quite different. I mean, it looks quite familiar to us if we take those away. They take so much gravity. They're exceptional stories. They're, from a storytelling standpoint, there's a lot to work with. From a myth-making standpoint, there's a lot to work with. So it's no wonder they become these mythological public history stories. But in terms of how they represent California history, they, they don't. That's the argument I'm gonna make because I think we can see better when we blind ourselves to those. How are we doing on time? And, and do we wanna open it up to more specific questions? I think we've got about a half hour. I've had a little bit of a snafu with my computer, so I had to change, change some things, so. We are at 5.04. Um, you guys have been answering a lot of the questions that have been coming up, but one that has recently come up is, what do you think of when you think of thriving today? Ooh, that's, that's a, a question. yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think, I mean, I read, I remember, I've read the quote and I, I think that sometimes when we when we think about American Indian history, I think too often people you always like will revert back to the negative. Whether it is as some, I think that was said in the, in the in the chat, right? Um, high incidence of you know incarceration or high dropout rates in schools or or, or poverty rates or or something along those lines, and I think that only kind of addresses kind of half the story, and kind of. Uh, it only kind of addresses half the story. So I, I think that we understood that when we wrote this book, we had to strike a balance. We had to strike a balance between uh, addressing settler colonialism in indigenous people's lives, but also then kind of addressing the fact that, hey, indigenous nations are still here. Um, and are, right, if you go to reservations, right, you see examples of, of thriving indigenous people and indigenous nations in the modern, in the modern day. I, I don't have a lot more to add to that, but I, I think I would just say thriving in my sense uh, is the ability to control one's cultural way of life and, uh, and to be able to nurture it as it grows and adapts so that the power, the capacity to nurture one's culture, to protect it, yes, but also to nurture its growth. Um, is, uh, is how I, I, would, I think about it. And you know, to Nathan's question, he asks in the chat, did you account for Baja California in the book? We don't. And um, we've, Willie and I have talked about this. That's you know, a big chunk of my current project. Um, but, and the more I work on it, the more I realize uh, that doing more with Baja could have um, enriched the, the book. You know, we, a lot of really good stuff ended up on the the cutting room floor. And um, we didn't spend a lot of time working with Baja, it came up a few times. Um, another example of that is, uh, you know, when I teach the book, uh, one of the things that I always do uh, is make sure that I uh, teach the Kelp Highway thesis, this idea that's come become pretty standardized in the last couple decades, uh, 
uh, that posits that pop that indigenous people populated the coast of North and South America by water, not by crossing over the Bering Strait and going through the tundra and then crossing the mountain, the Rocky Mountains to get to the beach. It's a real easy thing to teach to your students. You know, I just kind of point at like, which of these, these two things would you like to do today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day? Would you rather paddle along the beach or would you rather hike through tundra? And you know, you start there and you can draw these things out because the science behind it is that these kelp forests uh, really mitigated the waves, so it made the uh, travel along uh, made travel along the coast quite easy. It provided abundance of food. It helped uh, uh, make it easier to locate uh, fresh water and a lot of stuff like this. So you know, day by day, I would much rather paddle a little further down the coast. Um, and so this theory is pretty widely accepted now. We talked about it a lot. We wrote about it in the book. It was in there for a while. And at some point, I think just for editorial choices or for length, we took it out. And, you know, I mean, the, I can't wait to put that back in if we get a second edition. Um, there's a lot of those sorts of things. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, it, you know, kind of building on your point there, Dave, I, I think one of the things that we, that it's, that's always a struggle when you kind of write these kind of books is, is, a, is balancing between kind of the kind of the standard kind of anthropological or archaeological explanation for things, and then whether or not kind of emphasizing kind of indigenous, you know, kind of creation stories and how to kind of strike the balance between those two uh, viewpoints. Other questions? Or should we look straight to the chat? Um, I can read them off or you yeah. can look. Either way is fine. Um, one that I saw come through. Do you have any additional resources for K through 12 California Native American history? So I'll take that one. I used to teach high school in LA, um, San Fernando Valley, John H. Francis Polytechnic High School. And uh, just down the street from the Mission San Fernando. And uh, I've written a little about this. I haven't finished this article. I've played around with it, but um, there's some work to be done there. Uh, the short answer is no, we don't have any materials specifically geared toward like support materials, those sorts of things. But there are some great groups that are working on some of that stuff. And we mentioned that in the book. Um, and I'm forgetting the name. It's kind of a, it, it's based out of UC Davis, but it's all over UC now. There's a co cooperative and I'm just forgetting the name um, who are doing curriculum development because as anybody who's ever like, you know, taught high school or gone to high school or been close to a high school knows there's this state mandated curriculum that, that just drives so heavily what teachers feel comfortable doing in a classroom. And um, for a while, there was a program called Teaching American History, a grant put out by the federal government. And it took scholars who are doing original research and put them in contact with groups of high school teachers. And I did a couple of these. And the, these high school teachers would come to the sessions and say, it says we have to talk about Buffalo. Why? And I'd say, Quick, let's talk about Buffalo. You know, and, I'd, and they'd be like, oh, thank you. And it, it, it's just they want to understand how to, to manage this, but this, the curriculum is driven by these standards. So in California, um, Native people have a very hard time appearing in the standards in the 20th century. And I can't recall the exact details right now, so I'm just going to kind of sketch this from memory. But there's been some curriculum development that's done a really good job of kind of, kind of like bending um, 20th century California Indian histories into the curriculum. Uh, so for example, I remember that there was one piece of curriculum that I uh, read about that was making comparisons between the Philippine War, uh, the Spanish American War, but US activity in the Philippines with US activities in Native American uh, circles, which is a very logical connection, but a way you can bring Native people in that way because that's required to teach, but Native people aren't. And some other ones about student activism and this sort of stuff, but it is it is hard within the current structure to bring native people into the 20th century, and that's a legacy of this kind of disappearing act. There's changes afoot, ethnic studies. Um, I'm sure people on the chat and the call know this better than I do, but there's been some dramatic changes. LA Unified, I think San Francisco Unified, within the last couple of years, have made great strides toward including ethnic studies as a part of the requirement 
uh, which opens doors. If ethnic studies is a requirement, then now you can bring curriculum in there. Something I'd love well, to I mean, do. I mean, Damon, I, don't you, I mean, this is kind of one of the target audiences we had for the book, right? I mean, I, I think we wanted to have something that was there for K through 12 teachers that, could, that they could use and, and um, you know, kind of incorporate into classes if, if, if they needed to. Um, Right, like the kids you're saying, like one kind of obvious kind of example would be right, if, if you want to kind of talk about the, the New Deal in the 1930s, also spend a little bit of time talking about kind of the, the, the Indian New Deal and the Indian Reorganization Act and the development of kind of, you know, for good or bad, right, uh, you know, tribal governments that and tribal constitutions that come out of the, the, the 1930s. So there, I mean, there's, I understand, you know, obviously kind of the limitations and the diff, you know, the limitations and, and, the, and the time that is needed to do that. But I, I, I do think we, I, I think we envision this book to kind of help in that, in that kind of capacity. We and have I, a one other quick thought here. And I do think the spatial vignettes do help. I've heard some feedback from people um, who, uh, I actually, I was up in Oakland in September and went to the press to talk about a few things talk about this book project and um, anyway our editor walked me around and introduced me to some people and one of them said oh my god I love your book because I can just hand it to like family that are teachers and she was specifically mentioning the spatial vignettes and I think that that kind of writing a place-based writing we need a lot more of that we need a lot more attention to um, indigenous spaces in the present and I think that would be a real great resource for teachers to go to when they're you know, because when Native people do show up in the curriculum, um, they should be local Native people. That's, that's the, the ideal situation, um, at least in some capacity. We have another question. Um, it's, did you dig into Maori voyaging up, to, voyaging to California up to Alaska in the pre-gold rush and probably pre-colonial days? That is not something that we addressed in 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 the book. Um, I you know I think the the interesting thing about I think that what that question kind of gets me to think about is is that there was a kind of a little bit of an opportunity to kind of think about this a bit more kind of hemispherically or kind of what Pacific world ish if we want to get into kind of jargon if we want to get back into jargon. I mean, I, um, uh, David Chang, who teaches at the University of Minnesota, for instance, has done some really kind of great work on kind of the, the connections between the islands of Hawaii and, and, and California uh, in the gold rush, especially during the gold rush and, and kind of the, the kinship relationships and the economic relationships that existed there. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't kind of pick up as much on those kinds of things as, as maybe we could have in, in, the, in the text. Um, but it's also, it's something to kind of consider and, and think about uh, in this kind of mythical second edition that I'm pitching. I, I don't have anything to add. David Chang was the book I was going to mention that alongside others, David Igler's wor uh, work. I mean, there's, a, there's some great work on the Pacific world. Um, we had to draw boundaries around ourselves. Um, we were driven by our own goals of having the book be a public facing book to get it in under 300 pages. And I think it's 298. I can't remember exactly. The text is a little over 300. I was wrong. But what actually one of the things that I think I really, uh, that I appreciated that we, that we emphasized was, uh, was kind of thinking about California Indians as travelers themselves is that California Indians were not say confined to the current boundaries of, of California. They moved about like we, I know we have you know discussions of, of uh, indigenous Californians traveling to say New Mexico in the 1820s and 1830s, um, and, you know kind of this movement of kind of indigenous peoples kind of uh, throughout kind of the, the continent was something that we we focus on. This it's not indigenous Californians aren't stationary, right? They've never been stationary. They're not stationary now, uh, and so it is. We kind of we try to kind of tease out and play out this kind of idea about of of kind of mobility. Uh, it, for, for, for indigenous people. And that's, uh, that's, um, that's the basis of one of our spatial vignettes, which is Rome, um, because uh, in 1834, um, two young Los Angeles boys left Mexico City. They came to Mexico City in 1832, and then in 1834, they left Mexico City and went to, I think, a few places in Europe before in their journey to Rome, um, but they were there to study at the uh, 
the, the college, the, uh, the apostolic college of propaganda, the, the college that was in Rome that was designed to train local people to be priests to go back to their homeland and carry on the Catholic mission. Um, and these two boys, Ajapito Amamix and Pablo Tak, uh, died there in Rome, um, but not before Pablo had written a very fascinating and amazing piece of work uh, that we've known about for a while, but that's, a, that's, I think, a good example of like what we can do with some stories that we know. It's fascinating that this 19-year-old, he died when he was 19, which is also a very easy thing to teach to college students. You know, when I have them read sections of his book and then I say, let's unpack the story. He's 19, he's in Rome. You know, what have you done today? <laughs> and um, it's, it's an amazing uh, story, but also one of the underappreciated aspects of it is the amount of travel. I mean, twice now I've gone over to where the college used to be here and just sort of tried to sit there with that and imagine what it would have been like for, you know, um, for this place to exist in 1832, 1834. Um, and I think that idea of travel is a really um, important one. Well, and it's not only people, right? It's even uh, other than human relatives. I mean, I was in Edinburgh, Scotland over the summer and, um, you know, I was in the, the museum and there was a Chumash basket and a Yokut's basket and all of these things, right? These th people, you know, relatives kind of move across, you know, uh, have moved across, uh, across the world, so. We have another question. How does the indigenous history of California differ from that of other states? How is it distinct or different? It's a great question. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun one to answer. There's like three layers to it, I think. One is the density of the population. Um, if, I, if you think about them as like Venn diagrams, you know, there's, a, there's a portion of the North American continent uh, what, what, what we would now consider the United States and Canada, that Pacific coast was the most um, heavily populated, densely populated. And because of the nature of the environment, uh, people could live in relatively small spaces. I mean, they could, they could gather what they needed. It's an incredibly diverse landscape and ecosystem and everything else. Um, you know, I don't want to make fun of it at all, but you could just sort of like catch a, a, a salmon as it jumped out of the river and you could hunt here. I mean, everything was right there in abundance. Um, and so people developed very distinct and tight cultures and therefore uh, you had an incredible kind of diversity you don't find elsewhere. Um, there's pockets, but really it's distinctive to the, to the uh, Western coast of the United States. That's one layer. So that's not distinctive just to California. But then there's another layer, which I think is the mission project. And as we know, the mission project took place in the Spanish mission project took place in Florida and Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and California and other places. Um, but I think it, it, it had a, a um, it played perhaps its most important role in California and the Southwest. So again, I'm, I'm, Arizona, New Mexico are similar in that way. Um, and then I think in terms of, of the genocide, uh, there is not a clearer example of a genocide in American history than what happened to California Indians in the middle of the 19th century. And so when you layer those three things on it, top of it, what you get is a, a, a series of actions and reactions. For example, if one had gone to the missions, you knew some rudimentary Spanish, you got a new name. 10, 15 years, 20 years later, when people are massacring Indians, it makes it a lot easier to hide among the Mexicans, which is a term that was often used, um, uh, the number of phrases for it, but the idea that you just pass yourself off as, as being Mexican. And, um, and then that comes back in a really difficult way to challenge um, questions of recognition and enrollment and federal, all these sorts of questions. Now, so there's, when you put all those things together, it's a kind of stew that's really distinctive. I would I would add like I think the one thing that makes kind of California distinctive is uh, is the history of treaties in California, um, right? So so California Indians signed treaties with uh, the United States in 1851. The, those treaties are never ratified uh, uh, by the United States Senate, and so it puts California Indians in a kind of a very difficult situation where. Yes, there are reservations, uh, but many Californians, Indians were say kind of landless in the late, late, late 19th and early 20th century, which kind of leads to the creation of this kind of unique uh, trust, trust uh, entity called rancherias in California. 
uh, and, and I, I think kind of thinking about kind of the history of kind of, and then there, then kind of one of the kind of more famous kind of efforts to kind of get kind of claims or compensation um, for unratified treaties comes comes through California, uh, and then kind of the the kind of the activism that kind of respond that that comes out of the, that that kind of that uh, kind of being just kind of uh, disenchanted with that, that claims process, and and like especially kind of the Pitt River Nation in northeastern California, this this early call for like what we would now call land back, right? <laughs> you know, it's you know Pitt River people are saying that in the 1950s and the 1960s, and so you know I, I think that the, if we're thinking about something kind of distinctive, it's is kind of thinking about kind of thinking critically about about those treat about those treaties uh, in the in the 1850s and kind of the aftermath and the kind of the you know the political, economic, and social activism that comes uh, that California Indians kind of respond to and, and shape based on, on on that that different relationship with the federal government. Yeah, I would jump in and just say the Pitt River story is one that I really enjoyed writing about. I mean, I had taught it before a number of times, but digging into it, especially digging into Kent Blancett's work, um, his great book, and you know we were we, we struggling with how to deal with Alcatraz. Alcatraz is a very, is one of the, one of those little moments where the iceberg comes out of the, you can see the iceberg out of the water, but there's all this other stuff going on. But, you know, the, it's, it's a great story in itself. It's a complicated story. Most of the people on the island weren't California natives. There were obviously a few play very important roles, but it was, you know, there were also some California natives who were very um, frustrated that these natives from other places were coming in and occupying native land for California. And so it's a, it's a little, it's not quite the story we wanted it to be, although it's a good one, but pairing it with the Pitt River story um, shows how easily these kinds of interactions between people could translate back to the ground, almost like lightning striking and then hitting the ground. Because once the anger and resentment and activism that had been going on in the Pitt River kind of made contact with what was happening in the Bay Area through people like Richard Oakes and others, then all of a sudden it just happened and really got uh, uh, energized. And I think that was a really uh, rewarding part of that chapter. Also, these are really great questions. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, it's always weird when you're giving a talk and I see Willie and I see myself. And it's nice to know there are people who are asking really smart questions. We have another one. Um, in your conversations with your readers, what particular stories in the book have had a particular resonance with readers and why do you think that is? I'm thinking because we've talked about a couple of them. And so I'm trying to think of some that we haven't already talked about. I think I think for me, it's I, I think one as we've mentioned is I think people as David has, has mentioned is are the native the the vignettes these kind of short kind of granular not granular but kind of these kind of focused kind of stories about specific places from an indigenous perspective I think that those have kind of resonated with people especially you know people who who live in in places like Ukiah or play, you know maybe like as David had kind of mentioned earlier I think places that people think are remote and are not California, but actually from an indigenous perspective are quite kind of distinct in, in, in that way. And I think too, I think Damon, you were kind of alluding to this a little bit with, um, with your, um, uh, with the picture that you showed of the, of the boarding school students. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we really wanted to focus on in, in writing this book is making sure that people's stories kind of came through. And I think that's something that our advisor kind of pounded into our head, you know, our mutual advisor kind of pounded into our head is make sure that, that people show up. And so that when California Indian people kind of read this book and they might find, you know, a picture of, of their grandparent or have a, a kind of a story of, or their grandparent might be mentioned in the book. I, I think those are the things that I think that have resonated with, with the audiences and the people that I've talked to. Uh, yeah, I can't remember, Willie, maybe you remember, but somebody read the book and had that experience and mentioned it on a radio program or something where they opened the book and, and it was their grandmother. I the, love those stories. The other one I was going to say was uh, that that chapter nine, the one that I was just mentioning, um, you know, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. I don't quite understand um, 
why Greensboro did this, but but Greensboro selected Tommy Orange's book, They're There, for their One City, One Book uh, campaign, where you know everybody in the city is going to read the same book, and then there's a series of conversations, and then Tommy Orange came and gave a talk. And I, 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 when I read that they had made that selection, I thought, oh, that's wonderful. I don't think they know what they're doing. I don't think they understand what book they just chose. Um, but uh, given the fact that our book had just come out, um, the library reached out to me and I gave a couple talks to, uh, you know, a, a nursing home, uh, uh, some small local library, some book clubs. <laughs> and uh, so the, if you imagine who comes to book clubs in Greensboro, North Carolina, especially book clubs that happen in a retirement home. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about this, this book and most of them haven't read the book they just are trying to figure out if they should and so that was a really interesting way a, a number of people had read uh lots of people had read tommy orange's book which is a fascinating wonderful book um but a couple people had read our book and i think the connections between those were really uh resonated for me and for others i mean we um when tommy orange's book came out we were deep into the drafts of the of the ninth chapter and i remember I rushed and bought it and read it straight through and thought, yeah, I think we're, it felt good to feel like what he was writing about in an entirely different way from an entirely different perspective with a different audience, all that, but still the way he was describing some of those places, the Bay Area, Indian communities in the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s were really um, in line with what we'd been reading about. So that resonated with me and I think with some others as well. Okay, this is going to be the last question as we're getting near to time. Um, the image of the children captioned workday, what were they learning? Uh, trade or was it as education? This was the outing system. And Native students would do like, quote, traditional educational stuff um, in the morning and then in the afternoon would go out. Um, which means they'd go work, it, domestic work, uh, farm, printing, industrial stuff. Um, and then you do outing in the summer where you go for three months and do domestic work in the city if you're a woman or a girl or you farming. Um, you know, vineyards could write to the school and say, I need 12 boys and the school would supply. So the school became a, a labor contractor. And also the educational practices in the morning were... There's a there's a great kind of complicated story there, but when the Indian boarding school system was developed, it had a really high minded ideals about teaching this kind of like broad curriculum and that just collapsed within the first decade. And so certainly by the 1890s, the stuff that native people were being taught was like straight shots of childish civics and math, you know, enough to be able to uh, calculate how much you're owed for your crops. And, you know, and, and the director of the, of the Indian education program said, we shouldn't teach them piano. They're not gonna have a piano to play. I mean, so it's really just a very sad form of, 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 of book learning, but most of the time is outing. Yeah, I remember um, I, I've done a little bit of work, work, this kind of research before. And, and so they would take kids from, say, Round Valley who, you know, would work and work in the hot fields and, and do migrant farm work. And then they would take them to the off, to the Sherman Indian Institute down in Riverside, California, and their outing program would be picking oranges. <laughs> I mean, it's not I mean, it was it was very much this kind of vocational and, and not really kind of that kind of work was not even was not that much different than the work that they would be doing with their families when they were when they were back home. Okay, it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much, Damon and, and William, for your fascinating discussion and for taking the time to talk with all of us tonight. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, if you can fill out the survey, please do so. It'll appear in the browser as a pop-up and it will also be sent out via Eventbrite. And we hope to see you at our next event next year. So uh, sign up for notifications about that.